يشرح لي صدري ويكتب لي امري واحضر قصه في لساني يفهم قولي. اهلكم والله في بدايه الاسلام جريدنج السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته. So my dear brothers and sisters, inshallah today as the topic that has been uh, given for discussion is depression and anxiety. These are two very broad and in-depth subjects. Unfortunately, within our community, and even in general, amongst the masses, there is very little awareness on these subjects. It is much more common than any one of us might consider it or understand in regards to that. Let me give you some basic definitions of these concepts, and then we can work into it and look at the symptoms and the possible remedies in order to deal with these subjects. Now the depression, the word depression and anxiety usually has many what you call synonyms, which are cultural, some of them are medical, and some of them are commonly understood titles. Depression sometimes is related to, or is thought to be related to fear, concern, weakness, disorder, illness. At times, now we know it is more to do with mental illness and psychological trauma and such aspects. Depression, by definition, could be said that it is a common mental or medical illness that negatively affects how you feel, the way you think, and how you act. So these are very small symptoms of it, or the effects, or the consequences of depression itself. Now, how do you know whether you are depressed or not? How do you analyze whether what you are going through is a depression or not? At times, as I said, it is a complex combination. Sometimes when we are having a bad mood, sometimes when we are feeling ill, sometimes when we are feeling different, we might define it as depression, distress, and even the word anxiety comes into place at the same time. Some of the symptoms are you feel sad or you have a depressed mood, loss of interest or pleasure in certain regular activities. What you used to do normally, now you suddenly don't feel interested in doing that. Changes in appetite in your diet, trouble sleeping, loss of energy or increased fatigue. You feel more lazy and you want to go to bed quicker. Increase in purposeless physical activity. When you're doing something, you keep doing it, though there is not much pleasure or interest in doing it. It even slows down your speech. Observable actions. Feeling worthiness or guilty. Difficulty in thinking, taking decisions. Concentrating, focusing, or making uh, appropriate decisions. Thoughts of constant death or suicide or trouble. These are varying symptoms related to depression. So let me make one more point. Most of us, if not all, we all have certain worries and concerns within our lives. So we all may go to certain level of depression from time to time within our lives, within our day-to-day -day activities, within our day-to-day -day worries and concerns. So it is a constant, regular thing to happen. Now, it is important to distinguish between your usual sadness, your grief, to depression. Yes, depression may be defined at times also in regards to your sadness and your grief. For example, what just happened in Christchurch last month, we all felt sad about it. We all grieved for what we have seen and heard. Some people, while reacting to that, may have been distressed and reached the level of depression. While others, although depressed in its general sense, were able to cope with it. Probably the first time, if, if I don't know if all of you have watched the video, but if some of you have watched the video for another day, two, three, for people even over a week, they were not able to come out of that trauma of watching that, ter you know, that terrible video of the attack. It keeps replaying in the mind, and you're not able to sleep, you're waking up early, you're always feeling sad and grief for that period of time. So yes, there is sadness, there is grief, and there is another level which could be of depression. Sometimes some might define sadness and grief also as depression. 
So what I'm trying to distinguish here is there is a common man's language, there is a cultural language, and there is a medical language. In these three approaches or perspectives, we may be interchangeably using these words. I might say I'm sad, and the next moment I might define my sadness as depression. I might be medically depressed, and I might not know what medical depression is, so I might define it in, my, in a layman's terminology as sadness, as illness, as weakness, as some sort of disorder, as disinterest in doing certain things. So these are some of the aspects that we need to be aware of. Now, I would like to look into this from two different angles. One is a spiritual angle, from religiousness, from faithfulness, from having a religion and faith, and having trust and tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in dealing with aspects of depression and anxiety. On the other hand, we would look into the aspect or the angle of medical remedy towards this issue or this disorder or the illness of depression, and then we would also dwell into anxiety. Now the depression can happen to people genetically. Because your parents had depression, you may have some factors, some characteristics, some uh, you know, uh, issues from your genes in regards to having depression. There's also personality issues that can cause, as well as the environmental factors, as I mentioned. What just politically happened in Christchurch could have a huge impact on you. Or keep it aside now. Let's take it something very simple. You're walking on the road, somebody abuses you. You are at your workplace, somebody humiliates you. You are at your home. It's, a, it's an issue between husband and wife. It could be an issue between siblings. It could be an issue between your children and you. And somebody abuses you, accuses you, humiliates you, which may trigger depression in you. So all of these factors can contribute to varying levels of depression. Now, how to treat depression? Let's consider it. Let's take an example. I, go, I usually have, I usually get headaches, for example. Now, I get headaches, it could be due to lack of sleep. Yes, I may go and take Nurofen or Panadol, and it may treat me for a day, for another day, for a couple of days. But unless I deal with the actual factor of my sleeplessness, my headaches will continue. So my remedy is not the medical remedy. My remedy is a natural remedy, where I need to give enough time to sleep or have a proper sleeping schedule. Unless I fix that, the medical remedy is not going to assist me on a long run. Rather, it may have adverse effect. If I'm going to take four paradox every day for the next 15 days, it will have negative impact on my body. So at times, the remedy, we need to look at it, whether it is a medical remedy that will benefit, it is a psychological remedy that will benefit, that is a mental benefit, or is it a spiritual remedy that is required. So the remedies can be different. It could be medication, it could be psychological, uh, mental, or it could also be spiritual. Medically, the doctors attest, the medical field experts, they attest that people who have a strong belongingness, within the family, within the neighborhood, within the community, they do overcome some of these factors, some of these symptoms much quicker than the ones who are lonely. Not saying, not saying the vice versa is true, but at the same time, these are the factors. If you have a strong family bond, you have strong people around you, you have very good friends who you feel comfortable in discussing with them, issues that you have in your life, then that will have a positive impact in providing you remedy over these issues. For example, once again, you pick up the issue of Christchurch. The, the relatives of the victims who were either injured, attacked, or killed in the attack, the family members, the friends, would require a lot of support in order to overcome the depression that they may have been going through after they came to know about what had happened to their loved ones. Now, why overcoming that? Those individuals who have a very strong family, who have a very strong faith, who have very strong bonding with people around them, they may overcome quickly than the others. 
So for example, let's take some of the examples from the time of the Prophet Aisha radiallahu anha, she was accused of something very un-Islamic when she was left behind during the journey with the Prophet some of the people in the city, they accused her of adultery, fornication. Now that did affect Aisha radiallahu anha to a large extent. She was, she was feeling lonely, though she is with the Prophet the best person on earth, but she did have that grieving, that sadness that she was going through. Now probably in the medical language, that might even reach the level of depression. We do not know because we did not diagnose her or analyze her at that moment. But she did go through that, that, that sadness and grief. Let's take another example of one of the prophets. The father of Yusuf السلام, when he was lost, when he was taken away, when he was kidnapped, he cried, he was grieving, he was sad to the extent that his crying led him to blindness. That is not a day's sadness, that is not a week's grieving. That is a long period of crying with tears in the eyes for a long period of time. Medically, you might define it as depression. So these incidents happen. Now, it does not mean Aisha radiallahu anha did not have tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. But what helped her overcome that, survive that? Because Aisha radiallahu anha, when she was accused and humiliated of that accusation, she did mention in one of the hadiths, she said that she felt as if she would be torn apart because of the sadness. She felt that she would now be torn apart, meaning she felt that she would burst because of the pain and the sadness and the grieving. So when she was going through, she was distressed. She may have been depressed. But the way she overcome is, probably she was not given any medicine, no chemical uh, you know, uh, medicine that was provided to her, but she overcome that situation. How? With strength, with mental strength, with tawakkal, with the spirituality on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having tawakkal on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one aspect of the remedy. Is this the only aspect of the remedy? No. When asked to the scholars that should we treat depression and you know illness of anxiety only with spirituality, such as making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, such as doing ruqya, reciting Quran on yourself or somebody reciting on, on you, which is you know Islamically titled as ruqya, by making dua to Allah, by doing ruqya, and by doing good deeds, getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the prayers, through the recitation of the Quran, through dhikr and through will of the names of Allah and by attribution, attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scholar said, this is one of the major, one of the best ways to solve as a remedy to the, to the illness, to the disorder of depression and anxiety. But, they added, that if there is medical requirement, you need to provide yourself with that. Let me give one example. And hopefully we will be able to extract from this example the entire framework of dealing with depression and anxiety. There was a group of Sahaba, the Prophet Sallallahu sent them for certain work. They reached a place, but the people of that place, that tribe, were not very welcoming. They were very harsh to the Sahaba. While they were very harsh to the Sahaba, the Sahaba, they, they, they stayed outside their place. They um, put the Qiyam, they stayed there, outside their place, outside their city or their town. But the leader of that tribe, of that place, over the night, was bitten by a snake. Was bitten by a snake over the night. Either by a snake or another similar reptile. In the morning when they came, the whole city, the whole town came to know that he has been bitten with, by a poisonous reptile and he may die unless he is treated. Now they did not have any medical personnel in the vicinity. So they approached everybody who was in the area. They approached the group of the Sahaba. They asked them, could any one of you treat him with some sort of remedy? Now one of the companions, he said, I am happy to treat him with the remedy, with something. They said, okay, treat him with that, whatever you want. The Sahabi, he went and all he did, all he did, he did not apply a medical remedy, he did not apply any chemicals, all he did what he was, he did ruqya. He recited certain portion of the Quran on the sick person, on the victim. When he recited, over a small period of time, that person, the leader of the tribe, he was healed. Now when he was healed, obviously everyone in the town, 
was shocked and surprised what led to the healing. So they inquired and they found that this person, this Sahabi, recited something without any medical uh, ointment, without any chemicals being used. He simply recited something and blew over him and he was healed. Now when everybody asked this Sahabi, now he did not reveal it to those people, but when the companions of the other companions asked him, what did you recite? He said, I did not know much to recite except that I recited Surah Al-Fatiha on this person. That's all. All this Sahabi did was he recited Surah Al-Fatiha for the healing of the poison that was spilt inside the body of the person through a poisonous reptile. Technically, from a medical perspective, it's not possible. But Islamically, by the tawakkul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the spiritual methods and the remedies that we have, it did help in healing. Now, I'm not saying every one of us who can recite Surah Al-Fatiha or other parts of the Quran and Rukya, it will definitely heal. No, I'm not saying that. But it is one of the remedies to be applied. Either it will completely heal or it will assist in healing or it, or it will provide quick healing along with the medical support if you are providing it. So we need to apply both remedies while we are Muslims and while we have trust and belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one. Now with this example, all I want to extract is point number one. There has to be spiritual remedy for anything and everything. There is a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu the Prophet said, there is not a single disease or illness that has been sent on earth except that there is a remedy of it that has already been sent with it. So in this world, whether it is your headache all the way down to the cancer, whatever is there in this world, whatever evil, illness, sickness that is there in this world, there is a remedy for it in the world. Now the remedy could be either complete spiritual or complete medical or it could be a combination of both. While we have access to both, we should benefit and utilize both. So now coming down to this point, dealing with it from a spiritual remedy. Point number one, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are certain specific duas that the Prophet sallallahu mentioned in regards to depression and anxiety. The Sahaba, they asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa how to deal this problem, how to deal this with this particular um, uh, problem of depression, sadness and grieving. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa gave certain du'as which are very clearly mentioned in the Sahih, in Sahih Bukhari, in Sahih Muslim, as well as the other books of Hadith. One of the du'as that I would mention, which is easy even for all of us to read it as well to memorize it even now, inshallah. So these are three uh, three portions of the of the dua. One is the first one is La ilaha illallah al Azimul Halim. La ilaha illallah. Everyone of us remembers it. La ilaha illallah al Azim al Halim. This is the first part. The second is La ilaha illallah Rabbul Arsh al Azim, which is you know we recite Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. Similar to that, La ilaha illallah Rabbil Arsh al Azim, the one who is the God of the mighty of the the Lord of the mighty throne. The third portion is La ilaha illallah Rabbi samawati wa Rabbi al-awf wa Rabbi al-arsh al So these are the three portions of the dua, three ayat, three statements. La ilaha illallah al-azim al-halim. La ilaha illallah Rabbi al-arsh al La ilaha illallah Rabbi samawati wa Rabbi al-awf wa Rabbi al-arsh al So this is one of the dua that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave especially. And this is mentioned in both Bukhari and Muslim. So we know the strength of, uh, of uh, any hadith which is mentioned in both. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu narrated from the Prophet regarding this dua. There are other duas as well. For example, Anas radiallahu anhu, he reported in one of the hadith, he said, the Prophet said to recite, Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum, bi rahmatika astaghis. Very small. Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum, two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum, bi rahmatika astaghis. Which means, O ever living one, O everlasting one, by your mercy I seek your help. So we can see that very clearly there are du'as specific for depression and anxiety mentioned in the books of hadith from the Prophet So one of the ways quickly to treat it is the spiritual remedy, quickly make du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The middle aspect between the spiritual remedy and the medical remedy, I would say, is the social environmental factors. One of the instances, Anas radiallahu an, a sahabi, he was very young at the time of the Prophet, a playful boy. He used to have a pet bird, and that bird died. 
He, as a young child, loved the birds so much that he was very, what do you call it? He was very sad. He was even crying, literally crying for the whole day. Now the Prophet ﷺ came to know from one of the companions that Anas, the young boy, his bird has died and he is crying. So the Prophet ﷺ, now imagine, the Prophet is the leader of the companions, leader of the city, leader of the people. He's facing all these enormous challenges, but he takes out time to go and catch up, meet with that young boy, Anas Allah. The Prophet goes and sits down with him and he asks, he inquires with Anas, what is making you sad? He says, my bird that you know, the one I love, has passed away, has died today. So the Prophet ﷺ sat with him, gave him time, asked him what made him sad. So Anas, he started to describe the bird. He started to talk about the bird, how good it was, how it was flying, how it was running around, and suddenly today, out of illness or whatever, this bird has died. So the Prophet gave his ear to Anas sat and heard him, whatever he had to say, what was saddening him. Now when Anas, was able to take out his grief, was able to speak out what, what was making him cry from inside. In a little, in a very short time, Anas felt normal. With that little small sitting with the Prophet, when the sitting finished, the Prophet stood up and walked, and Anas after that small sitting, he came out of that feeling of sadness, anxiety, depression, or crying for the bird. So what I'm trying to you know, analyze from this hadith is, it is important the social factors and the environmental factors affect the person with depression. At times, it is the social society that gives the illness of depression. If the husband abuses the wife, she can be depressed. If the wife starts to control the husband, he can be depressed. So it, it does happen. If somebody humiliates you, accuses you, abuses you, you can be affected by depression. If there is something that is concerning you too much, you may enter the zone of anxiety. So the social factors do have an impact on the person and can create the disorder of depression in the person. In order to remedy it, it is also the social environment that can assist. If you see somebody sad, if you see somebody going through some trouble, some trauma, some concern, some worry, that is why you have this cultural thing, asking each other, how are you? When you say, assalamu alaikum, you immediately say, how are you? I know nowadays there's no meaning to it. You say, how are you? You say, alhamdulillah, all good. There's no much discussion into that. But the whole idea, the whole concept of asking, how are you, is a serious, genuine question to the other person. When you say, assalam, you say, assalamu alaikum, you are saying to the person, I'm here for you. I'm here in order to support you. You can feel free and comfortable with me. You can discuss with me anything private that you have, which I am on your side. I will not make fun of you. I will not put you down. I will not go and tell others about what you have said to me. This is the promise that you are making when you say assalamu alaikum. And then you ask the person, how are you? That's a very genuine question. It should have been a genuine question that the person would then respond to you. Say, okay, I have gone through this trouble. This is my financial issue, or this is my family issue, or this is my you know, personal issue. And they discuss with you. And you, if you have the ability, you listen to them. At least listen to them. That will take out a lot of that anxiety that is in that person and will calm down the person. The second is if you are able to assist the person by physical means, that would be great. If you can't, then lead them to somebody who can assist. At least provide them with a spiritual remedy which is easy, which is to make dua. Ask the person to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, the person might already be praying and making dua, but it's stressing on that, reminding the person. Focusing on that is very, very important at times. When we look at the technical aspects of our life, we forget the spiritual aspects. And believe me, we might disagree on the percentage, but I would argue that 70 to 80% times when we have trouble, we do not turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the scholars, he very strongly suggested, he said, if a person is not waking up for tahajjud, to seek help of Allah, that means this person is not serious about the problem that he or she is facing. You get my point? We have to pray five prayers. We're not even arguing on that. Five prayers. Without five prayers, there is no solution. Praying five prayers, all the obligatory things are to be fulfilled, that has to be done. If you have a problem, for example, I have a financial problem, 
Okay, if I have a financial problem, I will spend months and days seeking help from people, from banks, from individuals, from family members, from here and from overseas. I may have spent 500 hours of seeking help, but have I really spent an hour seeking help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If I cannot wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning seeking help from Allah, but I can wake up at 2 a.m. In, in the morning to ring overseas because that's the time that that rich person is available, then it clearly shows the priority that I am giving in my life. If a person is not able to turn to Allah, then you tell that person, why, if you have a problem, turn to Allah. He says, I already turned to Allah, but it's not helping. Have you seriously woken up for Tahajjud? Have you seriously fulfilled all your five prayers? If not, then I'm saying that's the first and the foremost minimum thing that a person must be doing. So a reminder is obviously necessary. So if I have a problem, I come to you. You have a problem, you come to somebody. As a Muslim, as a brother and sister, we should immediately remind each other. And when somebody reminds you, take it seriously. Turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is an important aspect. Second, the social aspect. Listen to the person who is going through the sadness. Provide them assistance. Remind them. And if you can assist, lead them to the medical personnel or the experts or the skilled people, such as the psychologists or the psychiatrists or the medical doctors who are experts in this field to deal with. So take it to them. Coming to the third now, the medical field itself. We know, I would be sure, every one of you when you have gone to a GP for whatever illness, have you not come across instances where the GP or the doctor said to you, there's nothing that needs to be done, go back and treat it naturally. Treat it naturally. Probably every one of us have gone to medical doctors, to the GPs at least, and you must have had some instances where you mention about the illness and the doctor said, I would not recommend any medicine as of today because I do not see the problem reaching this far. So I would suggest go back and treat it naturally. For example, some might say, go and have you know, uh, some fruits. Some might say, you know, go and have proper sleep. Some might say, you know, change your schedule, whatever. But have we not come across situations where the doctor would advise, I wouldn't give you a medicine today because I do not think the problem has reached this level. So you better treat it naturally. Because medically, it is known that chemicals are not the first remedy. So we must not try to treat things naturally. What are the natural remedies as I said? Is spirituality and turning to social environment, community, society, family members, parents. Some people feel comfortable speaking to the uncle or to that aunt or to your mother or to your sister or to your brother. We all have different relationships and different levels of trust in different relationships. So wherever you feel comfortable, you can go and take assistance. Some people do not feel comfortable discussing their personal issues with anybody. There are many people like that. And many of us, we do not want to discuss with the parents, family members, husband, wife, children, nobody. You keep it to yourself, but you need help. In that situation, definitely sit for a counseling session with a psychologist or with a psychiatrist who may be able to assist you much quicker in your healing than you try to do it yourself. As we just saw with the Prophet ﷺ giving a sitting, a counseling session with Anas It was a counseling session in today's language. We saw Yaqub who, who cried over months and years. There was nobody who was giving counseling to him. So he went through it and it could be a longer period of time. We may go through that here. As well, the third, you go to the doctors, you go to the psychologists who may treat it medically with chemicals. So it, I'm not saying no to the medical treatment, but I'm saying medical doctors would attest that that is not the first and the best way to treat. Psychological trauma, psychological issues, anxiety, these are subjects which are very new to the medical field. So going to it immediately to treat with the chemicals is not the best approach. When having a headache or any other normal problem, you would be advised to do natural remedy first, then I would say even in these serious matters of psychological depression or anxiety, we should seek first approach with natural remedies. It could be, you know, for example, taking dates, taking honey, taking natural remedies, or the environmental factors, and then going to the med medication to assist ourselves with that. Towards the end, I would add, it is very important, we don't see conflict between these two aspects, the spiritual aspect versus the medical aspect, the mental aspect. At times, we see today in our community, there are a group of people who would say, only take the spiritual aspect and treatment and med uh, uh, remedy, but do not take any form of medication. 
On the other hand, you have some medical experts who would say only assist yourself or treat yourself or provide the remedy through the medication, through the psychologist. But do not look at the spiritual aspect because it has got nothing to do with it. I would say both are making an error. The treatment lies somewhere in between. It has to be a combination of both. Psychologists would agree. Psychologists would agree through their experiences. Individuals with a strong faith, individuals with a strong community belonging would have healing of depression and anxiety much quicker than those individuals who do not have that environment around them. It may affect. That is why you see the suicide rate. That is why you see depression and loneliness in the community growing because these days we are living in a society which is much more selfish than anything else. We have people who cannot trust each other because you see everybody abusing you. You see everybody humiliating you. You see everybody there for an opportunity to benefit out of you but not to assist you. So when you see all of these, people keep it to themselves and do not want to take assistance or do not want to benefit each other. In such situations, going to the medical experts is a necessity. So it is a combination of all. The remedies need to be provided accordingly and needs to be looked in all the actions, in all the directions. I would come towards the conclusion by um, just briefly looking at the uh, anxiety aspect. Um, by definition, anxiety would mean an uncomfortable feeling of nervousness or worry about something that is happening or might have, might have happened or may happen in the future. So you start to worry more than usual. We all have worries. We worry about what has happened yesterday. We worry about what is going to happen tomorrow. We worry about going to the workplace in the morning. You are rushing because the time is running out. You have to reach there in certain time. So it all creates anxiety. Anxiety is normal to a certain level. But when it reaches higher level, which is not healthy for the body, that is when the chemical imbalance in the body takes place and we need to treat it accordingly. Now, again, with, the, with dealing with anxiety, we cannot go back and repeat the whole session, but as we discussed, the spiritual remedy, social factors, as well as the future. With anxiety, take it this way, as a Muslim, as a believer, as a faithful person, what happens with us is, as Muslims, we know and we need to remind ourselves that this life is a temporal life. We are here for a time being. Whatever is happening with us is temporary. It is not going to be with us forever. With all the troubles and the difficulties that we are facing here in this world, with all that we want in this life but we are not able to achieve, with all the troubles that are happening with us which we never expected, if we have this at the back of our mind, if we know this from our mind and our hearts, that this life is temporary and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of all our affairs and we would be passing through this life into the next life where there will be every provision of everything that we wanted, then that can reduce our anxiety levels to a large extent. We all go through anxiety every day, probably every day, but we all are able to cope with it. But when it goes higher, if we have these basic fundamental principles of life, we know why we are here, the purpose of life, that this life is temporary, we have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have tawakkal in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever is happening with me is by the will of Allah and a good will come out of it, then we will be able to cope with it much quicker than treating medically without any of this. I'm not, I repeat again, I'm not rejecting the medical assistance, but all I'm saying is if we remove the spiritual strength, then the medical healing will not benefit. Imagine. How many people are committing suicide, even here in Australia, for example? The suicide rate is actually increasing. Why? Is the medication not available? The hotlines are not available? They are. Some of them are actually being treated and then they commit suicide while being treated. Some of them are under the treatment for over two years, then suddenly that person still commits suicide. So haven't the medications been given? Being given. Are the chemicals being provided to the body in order to cope with those feelings, with those sadnesses, with those, with those moods, with those anxieties? It is being but yet the person suddenly after two, 24 months of treatment commits a skill suicide, which was still the same thing two years ago. Why? Because of the lack of all this spiritual strength in the life of the person. So sometimes the medical field is blind to look at the spiritual aspect. Sometimes only looking at the spiritual aspect, we are blind, not treating with the medicine. Let me give you one last example. I have a headache, I take Panadol. As a Muslim, when I have a headache, I know I believe Panadol can do no harm, no benefit for me. This is our faith. This is our belief. 
I do believe firmly and strongly, unless Allah wills, that Panadol, that Nurofen cannot benefit me. If Allah wills, even cancer will be treated and I will come out of it. But while having that trust with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never told us to give up on the worldly means of treating it. And you remember the hadith when a sahabi came to the masjid, he brought his animal, his camel or the horse which he was riding, and he left it open and walked in. The Prophet said, why have you left it open? He said, tawakkal ala Allah. I have trust in Allah. The Prophet commanded him, go out, tie it, tie the animal to the tree, then do tawakkal on Allah. That is the approach we need to have. So do we need to do medical treatment? Yes. But do we only trust on the medical treatment? No. Medical doctors cannot treat every person with cancer. There are hundreds, thousands, probably millions dying of cancer, although every treatment is provided to them. There are people who do not have much you know, access to medical treatment, but they are treated through medication, the same medication. Why does it impact on somebody and not on the other? That's where you have to have tawakkal on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it goes hand in hand. The spiritual treatment and the medical treatment. The spiritual remedy and the medical remedy. Put it together and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assist us, will provide us and will help us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in one of the ayahs of the Quran, from Surah Nahan, Surah number 16, ayah number 97, man amila salihan min dhakarin aw unta wa huwa mu'minun fala nukhiyannahu hayatan tayyibah wa la nadziyannahum ajrahum bi ahsani ma kanu ya'madu whoever does good, whether male or female, and he or she is a believer, Allah says, we will most certainly make that person live a content life, a, a life of tranquility, a life of peace and happiness, and we will most certainly give them the reward for the best of what they did. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that those who are believers, those who good, do good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring peace and contentment in their lives. In one of the other ayahs of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Fatah, Sakina. Taskeen, that they will have with their prayers, with their belief, with their faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their hearts will be content. Meaning, whatever happens with them in their life, their depression and anxiety level will be controlled, will be satisfied with whatever they have in their life. When they face trouble, they say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiwan. Whatever trouble is facing me, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us these spiritual remedies within our day-to-day -day life. These are the basic remedies which should be applied by every Muslim in regular day-to-day -day activities. This will help us overcome most of the trauma and the trouble that we go through. Having said that, not everybody may be able to be treated with that. As we saw the example of Yaqub as we saw the example of Aisha radiallahu anha, as we saw the example of Khazar radiallahu anha, just like Tawakkal, they were not treated. It took time. It took time for the father of Yusuf alayhi salam to be healed. It took time for Aisha radiallahu anha to be healed until Allah revealed in the Quran that she is ma'asum, she is free from the uh, accusation. Until the Prophet sallallahu sat down with Ahmad radiallahu anha to give him that counseling session for him to overcome that. Does not mean Yaqub alayhi salam, does not mean Aisha radiallahu anha, does not mean Anha radiallahu anha had less tawakkal on Allah. No. They had much more tawakkal than any one of us could even argue. They were one of the best people that we could ever know of. But they required that. Even the Prophet ﷺ, in one of the hadiths, when the people were questioning the Prophet and the revelation from Allah did not come for a couple of days, it is said that the Prophet ﷺ was so distressed that one of the thoughts that came to the Prophet was, should he harm himself? Should he walk away? And we saw that Yunus alayhi salam, Remember, when his people did not listen to him and he was upset, he was sad, he was grieving that they were not listening to him, he left to the people. He left the city. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, reprimanded him by him being, you know, um, uh, in the ocean, was being sunk and was eaten by the big fish, by the whale. And the dua that Yunus alayhi salam made, as mentioned in the Quran, it is also one of the important duas to make dua in order to come out of depression and anxiety. So my point is, if somebody goes through depression, we should not say to them, you do not have tawakkal on Allah. That's the point I'm trying to make. <coughs> Having tawakkal on Allah reduces the problem of depression, no denial. But if somebody still has depression or anxiety, do not say to them that you do not have tawakkal on Allah, that is why you are having depression. No, depression can reach medical necessity. Depression can reach medical necessity. So the people 
any of our relatives, friends or family who go through this trouble, yes, provide them the spiritual remedy. That's the first and foremost necessity. But if they are not being healed alone by it, then they require medical assistance. They require expert assistance through the psychologists and psychiatrists. So let them be getting assistance through those means. Wa akhil da'wana and alhamdulillahi